Well, good morning, Southside. It's the Lord's Day where we gather weekly on the day that Jesus rose from the grave, ushering in a new era, a new covenant, one that is ruled by grace. And we gather to celebrate our great salvation. So I got to be a part of the newcomers class this morning. What an encouragement for some of the beautiful hearts and what God is doing uh, in all of them. And we're praying about, I think it'll be an announcement for a night of testimony to hear some of the newcomers' uh, salvation and us to get to know them and really help them into this body. So I invite you to that. Also, the, one of the more important announcements is the softball league is starting up this summer. <laughs> so look at the announcement for that. Brian is going to be overseeing that again. I um, encourage you to come watch them sometime and we'll put it on the website, the schedule. This morning, we are going to take back up in our study in Romans. So if you'll turn to Romans chapter 7, special thank you to Rick Hallahan who jumped in at a moment's notice. His spiritual gift is you can ask him two minutes before he's to preach and say, can you preach? And he'll get up there and hit it out of the park every time. So thank you, brother, for helping out at an emergency for me. Well, the last time we were together in Romans... We finished up chapter six, and anytime we finish a chapter at Southside, it's a big deal. (laughs) So this morning, we are going to look at chapter seven, and we're going to narrow in on verses one through four, and then next week, we're going to look at verses five through six, just a beautiful section of scripture. Today, we are going to look at marriage, and one sermon, we're going to see the worst marriage ever. We, We truly were the bride from hell. And we're going to end with the best marriage ever because of the best bridegroom ever, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think all of us have seen a marriage or we have been in it where it just bears bad fruit. And it's doomed from the start. You can almost see it. And no matter how hard they try, it just bears the deeds of the flesh. I think of Ahab and Jezebel. That was, Ahab was the worst king that Israel ever had. Jezebel was a pure idolater, and they just died under the wrath of God. It just bore fruit for death. So our relationship to the law and our fallen state was a marriage that was just no good. It was doomed from the very start. And you see, its purpose was to produce a horrible marriage. The law was given to produce a horrible marriage. Like, like, like a bad marriage, it reveals the depth of your sin and the depth of your, your heart's rebellion so that it might lead you to Christ, to the best marriage ever, to an eternal marriage that ends in eternal bliss and you, you live happily ever after truly in this marriage. What is startling this morning about our text is that the goal of this marriage is to bear fruit in verse 4. Verse 4, that this would bear fruit for God. And verse 6, that, that you might serve God in newness of spirit. And so my prayer and desire for this church is the fruit of love that would flow out of this marriage and service to God and to one another. That we would fulfill the law. And the fulfillment of the whole law is to love God and love others. And what jumps out at me is we have a law that commands that. So the fruit that I'm longing for in your lives, the law commands it. That's the end goal. And Paul's going to tell us this morning that the only way to get to that fruit of the law is to, to live this kind of a life. You've got to die to the law. The law commands it. If you're ever going to bear it, you've got to die to the very thing that's commanding it. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So this could be why you've come here this morning and you've never been able to fulfill the law's demands. You're religious, but you've never been able to love the way God has called you to love him with your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbors, yourself. You still live under the law. You're religious, but you don't live under grace. And no matter how hard you try to obey the law's commands to love, Your selfish heart just can't do it. And I pray that God brought you here this morning to see that opened up that you might find freedom. I desire to do it, but the doing isn't present. And so what you do is you run more to law. You run more to rules. And how can I do better at this and work harder? You run to more religion. You run to more moral reform. But you can't get love from your heart no matter how hard you really try. Just external acts of making myself do things, but never the internal that just bubbles up into action. 
and your religion and your morality has never been able to break that. This message is for you this morning. I pray that God would teach us then from his holy word why only dead people can love. The solution to your loveless heart is not law, but being in law to Christ. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, I'm not under law, but I'm under the law of Christ. And that's what I hope to show you this morning. And so we need much help to take on a text that I think the whole Bible is in these these really one verse this morning. The the whole Bible. You ever want to know the whole Bible? You're going to get it all in one verse. And it's the exact opposite of the thinking of this world, which is always how you know you hit spiritual gold, is when it's the opposite of how the world thinks and acts. So what I want to do is I want to go before God and ask that he'll, he'll do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And he'll open up this word and that you might see it this morning in a way that will bring freedom. So let's go to our God and ask him to meet us. Father, we're a needy people. And there's confusion right out of the bat. The law commands love, and we have to die to it if we're ever going to be loving. And so, Lord, help us to understand that. Teach us from your word. Show us truth. God, maybe set some people free this morning from the law, and they've spent their life under it, and they can't get out from under it. And I pray this morning that this would be their deliverance. And I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ. God, here's the heart of true vital religion. This is the essence of Christianity, and I pray that you'll meet us and you'll show us it, and we will see it from your word, and your spirit will give us eyes to see, and we will rejoice and be transformed and changed by this glorious truth that we look at this morning. So meet us, Lord of the church, lampstand present this morning with us. Jesus, manifest, show us yourself from this word. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I want to start with the forest. Uh, How does Romans 7 fit into Romans? And so if you're visiting, you get a a quick review. Paul writes this epistle in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to bring men, women, and children into this realm of salvation. There's no other way to get into that realm but through this gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Paul begins the gospel. He starts three chapters on the bad news before he mentions good news. Paul spends three chapters to show everyone, Jew or Gentile, religious or irreligious, that you are under the wrath of God and you can't get out from under it. You can't be moral enough to get out from under it. There's no way out in your own strength and your own working. Romans 3.20, he says that the law was given, not that you could be justified, but that it would show you your sinfulness and you would flee to Christ to be saved. So we spent a long season on understanding our need for a gospel. And then we moved to Romans 3.21. But now God has done something to rescue us from that. Jesus came into the world to endure an infinite punishment in our place for our sins on the cross of Calvary. He took the law's condemnation for all of our transgressions of it. And he went up there and he bore God's justice and wrath for our transgressions of the holy law. And then he came to provide a perfect righteousness by fulfilling the law's demands. God demands perfection if you're going to be in his presence. And so Jesus came and gave that perfection. He didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. And he fulfilled it perfectly. The law was perfectly punished. And the law was perfectly obeyed in Christ. God came into the world. And this was done through Christ. And then he tells us the way you get the salvation is not by works, not by being religious, changing your life, being good people. The way you get this is by an empty hand that looks to nothing but what I just said, Jesus Christ alone. Faith in all of our punishment for our sin and all of the righteousness that God requires was in Christ. We receive that and we receive Christ as our infinite treasure and our love. And now... The law cannot justify us. The law cannot get us right with God. And we're in a section now, I want you to see, the law can't sanctify you either. The law cannot sanctify you, and I need you to hear that. It cannot change your heart, and it cannot bring about the fruit of obedience, which is love. And so I want you to follow the argument. We're now in chapters 6 through 8. Paul is dealing with an antagonist who comes and he thinks this way. 
well, why don't we just sin then that grace might abound? If, if, if by my sins glorify God by him forgiving them, let me just sin, 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 and I'll put God on display. Let's just sin. Paul's answer, real short, dead people don't sin. At your baptism, you, you died a spiritual death, and you were buried, and you've been raised to walk in newness of life. Sin's dominion has been broken. A believer doesn't try to get more of sin. He wants less of sin. And then he drops that beautiful verse that we looked at on one snowy day when I was here all by myself. Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. And this is sanctification, living the Christian life. It will not rule over you. Why? You're no longer under the law, but you're under grace. And so coming under grace can break the power of sin and change your life in a way that law never could. And then Romans 6, 15, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? And the answer is, Paul, spend the rest of that chapter, you have a new slavery. <clears throat> You're not enslaved to sin anymore, but you have a new slavery from the heart. Is God, here's my life. I'm your slave. I will serve you the rest of my days. That's what happens in salvation. So there's one problem. Do you see it? I hope you see it. Did Paul even mention law? From Romans 6.15 to 6.23. He doesn't even mention the law and these commandments. And he, and he says that you got, you got to die to that. If you die to the law, aren't you just going to be lawless? Won't you just be an antinomian? If you die to the standards and the laws, what, what's going to keep you from just going and sinning and doing whatever you want? There's, there's, there's no standard. You, you can just live what you want. What, what happened to the two-thirds of our Bible in the Old Testament? Is it just gone? Do you tear it out? Help me with this. Paul's going to now answer that in Romans chapter 7, where the law, I want you to hear this, is mentioned 23 times in chapter 7. So here's our answer to 614. 15 through 23 is the explanation, but now let's go into what about the law? And so even a guy like me can figure out law is the focus in chapter 7 when it mentions it 23 times. We got to get out from being under law. If you're ever going to bear fruit for the kingdom of God, you have to come out from under the law. So why do I got to get out of this bad relationship? Like most bad relationships, you don't see it. You think, oh, I can fix this person. I can make it better. With a little work and prayer and fasting, any demon can come out of that man. Why do I have to die to law? And what is more, how does dying to the law produce fruit for God? And how does being under the law produce sin and bad fruit and death? And so I'm going to drop my conclusion from this section at the beginning, and I'm going to prove it for the rest of this study. And first, then, is the law is not a means to salvation. The law could not get you justified before God. And I want you to hear this. The law cannot sanctify you. It cannot do either. We must die to it. And the freedom that is going to be offered to you in the next two weeks is beautiful. And I'm going to be praying and asking God that everyone in this place would understand this and get what Paul's getting after because I don't think many people in the church get this anymore. Here's our outline. Romans 7, 1 through 6. In verse 1, Paul gives us an axiom, which is just a, an axiomatic truth, a statement. Verses 2 through 3, we're going to look at an analogy. And then in verses 4 through 6, we will look at the application. So come with me to verse 1 and look at our axiom. Paul says in verse 1, or do you not know? Has that not been our theme through 6 and 7? He keeps saying, do you not know? Do you not know this? Don't, don't you guys know this? As believers, you should know this. And do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law. And so for sure, I'm, I'm speaking to Jewish readers, to proselytes who have been Gentile converts to Judaism, you know the law. But this letter was written to a Gentile, mostly a Gentile congregation, and he quotes the Old Testament throughout it. So it, really, it's the whole church. All you believers, you, you know the law. That, that should be everyone here this morning is you know the Old Testament. I'm speaking to you who know the law. And so this is to those who, who know the law and our relationship to it. And here's the axiom that he drops. That the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. And so he's not talking about Roman law. 
He's not talking about civil law. What he's talking about here is the Mosaic law. And we can be very dogmatic that that's what he's getting after. Romans 5, 13. <clears throat> For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. And it's referring when the Mosaic law was given. Romans 5, 20. The law came in so that transgression would increase the Mosaic law. You are not under law in Romans 6, 14. It was Mosaic. Romans 7, 7 through 11, Paul says the law came and it said don't covet and it produced coveting of every sort from the Ten Commandments. So what we are looking at, there's really very little debate among really conservative commentators. This is the Mosaic law. And so this law has a jurisdiction. In the ESV, it, it says lording. It, it, it rules over you. The law rules over you. Romans 6, 9, 6, 14, it, it's master over you. And so the law has jurisdiction over a person then as long as he lives. This whole section, Paul keeps making the connection with where law rules, sin rules. It just law, sin. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. And so the law gives power to sin, and sin gives forth to death. Uh, Romans 5.20, sin reigned in death. So this whole section is you got this connection of law, sin, and death. And he says that you're, you're under this jurisdiction as long as you live. You're born under the law. The Mosaic law had jurisdiction. They were circumcised on the eighth day. We're going to keep this law. We're making a commitment to it. And they lived under its realm, its rules, its demands until they died. And they, when they died, they come out from under it. And they would be judged by it in Romans 2. But the only way to be free from Torah was death. And that's a concept that I think as Americans, it's not too hard for us to get. As long as we're citizens living in America, the law has jurisdiction over us. We're all under the law as long as we live in America. When we die... It no longer has jurisdiction over us. And that's why we, a death penalty, when you're done, you pay it, you're finished. Lee Harvey Oswald was never tried. That's the principle then that Paul's going to build this whole section. So our axiom this morning is that law only applies to people who are alive. The law does not bind the dead. The dead come out from under the law. That's the principle we're going to build on. So any questions? <laughs> That's, that's our principle. Jay, what is it, brother? Second point now is if you'll track with me, you're going to get an all-you-can-eat buffet. There's an analogy now in verses 2 through 3. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he's living. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law concerning the husband. So then if while her husband is living, she's joined to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law that she's not an adulteress, though she's joined to another man. <clears throat> so Paul now moves to a very simple analogy. And I want you to hear this. It's not allegory. So allegory is where everything kind of matches up. And, and so this analogy is just one simple principle. Uh, it, it, it's stating this, that death changes everything. And in verse 2, the analogy is you got a woman. She's bound to her husband by law. But if he dies, she's released from the law. She's no longer under it. And so the point is simple. When the husband dies, it changes her relationship to the law. And now she's out from under it. And she can go and remarry freely. Now in verse 3, there are two cases. There's a woman now then who marries another man. And when she does, she's called an adulteress. And then there's another scenario that if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. So what makes the difference of when she gets remarried is one's an adulteress, one isn't? Well, the answer is death. Death is what made her free from the law. And so the law only applies to marriage when both are alive. What is your marriage vow that you make? As long as you both shall live. Someone dies, you're out from under that. So if a death, the law, the vow is over, you're no longer under its jurisdiction. You come out. And she's just as free as she was before she was married. She's no longer bound by that law. Death freed her from the law. <coughs> you with me? 
Isn't that a great illustration? I don't want you to miss the simplicity and the beauty of what Paul is saying here. 20 years ago, I was teaching all my little kids. They were just little guys and girls, and I was explaining Romans 7. I'd always preach to them whatever I was preaching the night before, and I, I, they got distracted. And I remember the boys are like, well, if mom dies, who would you marry? And <laughs> there were three single guys in the church that they were terrified that mom might remarry. And, and every time one of them got married, there was a celebration in my home. Like, and so don't get distracted with the wrong thing. Paul was making this illustration to help clarify truth. And the result is this passage has caused incredible confusion throughout church history. And here's why. Here's your analogy. You have a husband who's the law. You have a woman who's the believer, right? So we're married to the law, um, cannot be released until death occurs. And what I expect Paul to say is the law died, right? The husband died. So he's saying the law died and through his death were released. And that's where all these heresies have come and caused all the, the problem. And Paul doesn't say that. He says, we've been put to death to the law. And this makes a big mess <laughs> trying to tie it all together if you want to fit every detail together. And many have tried and have created horrible heresies and wrong theologies that aren't even biblical. So the problem is Paul cannot say that the law was put to death. Romans 3.31, do I nullify the law? No, I establish it by this gospel. So it's, it's we who have been put to death. And that's where it all kind of falls apart a little bit. And so it's important then that this is an illustration, not an allegory. And so everything doesn't match up. You're, you're going to get lost if you try to do that in this text. And verse 4 is not intended to correspond exactly to the illustration. So it's common to make this mistake when you interpret parables and you try to tie every piece together and you can end up in horrible places. Parables are usually a simple point being made, not intended to be this allegory where everything matches up. So I want you to catch this. The main point of the illustration is that by the death of her husband, the woman is released from the law. The main point of the application is how can we be released from the law? Well, a death has to release us from the law as much as a death of a husband. And that's where we're going to move now to one of the most beautiful applications I've seen since I've been studying Scripture. Look with me in verse 4. What, my question is, Paul, why would you use this illustration if it's confused everyone throughout church history? Well, it's the perfect illustration to show that death frees from the law, and it frees you to another relationship. That's the, the heart of what Paul is driving hard after in this passage, a death that frees you to where you can now move into another relationship. That's why he risked all the allegory and things going on in this passage, and I'm going to show you now why he picked this and why it's so beautiful. Verse 4, my favorite word, therefore, therefore, what is our takeaway from what I just talked about? You're probably bored stiff. What's going on? What, what is it there for? What does Paul want us to get? Well, before I answer that, I just want one quick observation before we look at this. There are no commands here. We're not being commanded to die to the law. It's an indicative. Remember, we've learned indicatives. It's a statement of fact. It's done. It's not an imperative. It's not commanding you. You're not commanded to die to the law. It's happened when you believed in Christ. You have died to the law. And this is what has taken place when you believe. This is a reality of your relationship to the law this morning. Believer, you were made to die to the law, the Mosaic law, the covenant. We are no longer under the jurisdiction of that old covenant. Hear that. You are out from under the Mosaic law. And I'm going to flush that out, but I want you to hear this in your mind and in your heart. You are no longer under law, but you are under grace. It can change your life if you understand what I'm talking about, and that's where we're going to go now. My brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. You were made to die to the law, the Mosaic law that said, do 
and live. Disobey and die. And have wrath and condemnation for your disobedience. This law of performance. You died to that. You came out from under the jurisdiction of that law. And it has no claim on you any longer this morning. You are not under this covenant as a way of life. In the next two weeks, we're going to look extensively at how you died to the law. It's so important. But there's only one way out from under this law. You have to die. There has to be a death, and it must be your death to come out from under law. And so the question is, how did I die to the law? How did I die to the law? What did Paul say? He uses an instrumental here through the instrument of the body of Christ. The way I died was through the body of Christ. Help me. Pastor, well, look, go back to Romans 6, 3 through 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. But when I preached that, we had baptisms, and I bring it up again, we had baptisms. They're just pictures of death to that old life and to being under the law by faith. So I just want you to hear this one more time. Jesus was born under the law. He came in under the law, and he kept it. He fulfilled it in our place, and he went up on the cross, and he took the penalty for every transgression that I ever did. And it went down into the grave and it was dealt with and it's been raised. So he took all of my offenses and he took them to the cross and to the grave and he rose and I believed and by faith I'm united to him and all of his works, all of his benefits, all that he is. Christ died to the law and I died to the law in him. And so brothers and sisters, my death occurred by faith in Christ and I've come out from under the law's lordship. I'm out from under its jurisdiction. If you want to go under it, he says, you got to keep it all. You got to do every last bit of it. I'm done with that. I have died to the law because Christ fulfilled it. Te telestai, it is finished. And I'm free from its condemning authority. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It can never condemn me again because Christ Jesus was condemned. And I'm free from its controlling authority power. And next week in verse 5, the law comes and it tells you to do good things and all it produces is sin. I'm out from under that. I'm out from its obligations and sanctions, its rules and regulations of covenant. The old is past and it's ready to disappear. The joy that this should bring to your heart, you're out from under its demands and consequences. You're not under law. And if I'm out from under its demands and consequences, why don't I just sin? I don't have a sword over my head any longer. The disobey and die is gone. Why don't we just go sin? New York, there's no police. What happened? Crimes are killing everyone. No sword. Let's just go eat, drink, and be merry. No holy standard. Let's celebrate. And that is why Paul's analogy is so beautiful. We died to the jurisdiction of the law so that we could be married to another. So that we could have freedom for a new marriage. And you're not going to be married to Moses. You're going to be married to Christ. You can't have two marriages. I have people sitting here this morning who are married to Moses and to Christ. That's a recipe for misery. So many in our churches in that state. By faith, I take Jesus and I go to heaven. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to work hard at God's commands the rest of my days to get his approval. You live every day like that with your little rose. He loves me. He loves me not. It's a miserable way to live your life. It's living under law. My performance is how God views me and accepts me. You've died to the law. You're free now for a new marriage. I owe the law nothing. No covenant, no commitment, no allegiance, no demands. I died to it. I'm out from its jurisdiction. And now I'm ready for a new marriage like the lady in our illustration. While the other marriage was no good, 
just, I think I was saying, baby, you're no good. <laughs> it's just that marriage was no good law and us, it just bore bad fruit. And, and what it's done though, is it's shown you how to pick a partner. <laughs> how do I get into a great marriage? One that, that can command me and now give me wings to do it. One that doesn't produce rebellion when it calls me to obedience, but glad surrender. That's the new covenant. Look at your bridegroom, the best man ever, fulfilling the law, loving God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and his neighbors himself. The, 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 the best man resurrected, seating, sitting at the right hand of God in total victory. That's who I'm married to. That's the new covenant. It's not a new list. It's a new person. And I'm married to the best person. I'm married to Christ, to his righteous life, his sacrificial death, his mercy, his love, his wisdom, his power, his indestructible life. I don't know what more I could do. You're married to Christ. That's a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> And we were not widowed. We were joined to the perfect bridegroom. And we're under a new jurisdiction called grace. We're not under law, but we're under grace. We're free to be joined to another. So we attend a funeral, we die to the law, and we attend a wedding at the same time. We're married to Christ. I love weddings, don't you? I think mine was my favorite. <laughs> but nothing compares to this blessed union with Christ. You have died to the law and you've been joined to another. And I want, to listen, I want you to listen to the vows that were made. I, Jesus, take thee sinner to be my wedded wife, the bride of Christ. And I do promise and covenant before God, the Heavenly Father, to be thy loving and faithful Savior in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrows, in sickness and in health, for this life and for all of eternity. And I, sinner, take thee, Jesus, to be my loving bridegroom and Savior. And I do promise and covenant before God, the Heavenly Father, to be thy loving and faithful bride. In plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, for this life and for all of eternity, I'm going to love you, Christ, forever. I don't think we understand these truths. Do you believe that you've been joined to the blessed Christ? I am his and he is mine. Listen to what Lloyd-Jones said, the great preacher. If you would know the love of Jesus and what it is, give him opportunities of telling you. He will meet you in the scriptures and he will tell you. Give time, give place, give opportunity. Set other things aside and say to other people, I cannot do what you asked me to do. I got another appointment. I know he's coming and I'm waiting for him. Do look for him. Are you expecting him? Do you allow him? Do you give him opportunities to speak to you and to let you know his love for you? He's eternally rich. He upholds the universe. You know what he doesn't ask for? A prenuptial agreement. I hate those things. If you have one, come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> he offers all that he is to us freely. I give you everything, unconditionally, you're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And I want you to get this, because I know some of you have been hurt bad by unfaithful spouses, and, and your, your pastors care deeply about that. You still carry wounds, they open up real easy, and some of you have had spouses leave you for another, and I want you to hear the glory of this covenant. Hebrews 13, 5, Jesus says, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. He'll never discover something in you and turn away and leave you and forsake you. Your bridegroom will never divorce you, and that's where this whole chapters are going to lead. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you and me. And so we've died to the law. And we've been set free that we might be joined to another by faith. And the, the another is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We're betrothed to him and we're joined to him spiritually forever. And so my question is, is how is this marriage going to end? The, this, this marriage, the honeymoon comes at the end. <laughs> I love it. One day the God of the universe is going to throw a huge celebration and feast. It's going to be the greatest celebration that's ever been held. And I want you to think of the best dinner you've ever been to, you know, where you just, everything's right. The perfect steak. You know, I like those, uh, not prime rib, what are the little small ones? Filets. I love those. Filets, creme brulee, great fellowship. Everything's just going great. This banquet is going to be spread in heaven. And the largest multitude that you've ever seen at a party is going to be there. All who have loved Christ and gave their lives to him. And they're going to be from all of history and every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. And we'll all be dressed in white clothes and perfect righteousness. And Jesus, the bridegroom, is going to enter. And, and there will be the great marriage supper of the Lamb. And in the way a husband and wife rejoice over one another, so we will forever. And all in attendance will understand the fullness of grace. I cannot imagine the excitement of this banquet. I just sometimes, our fellowship brings me to an amazing level. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? If you've been joined to Christ by faith, you will be there. And I just want you to hear that one more time. You will be there. God's grace will see to it. What a marriage. So what Paul is saying here is what I just told you. You don't hear that. Say, let me go sin that grace might abound. Let me go sin because I'm not under law, but under grace. Do you see the question? It should make you want to vomit. This is a reality for those who are in Christ Jesus. That doesn't produce sin. It produces hearts that love him and want to obey him. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's what this produces. So how does apathy fit with that? The marriage supper of the lamb and just half-heartedness? They just don't even fit. And so Paul knew what this marriage would produce. Look with me in verse 4. The fear of coming out from under law. I get beat up all the time. You can't preach that. You preach we're not under law. Everyone's going to go crazy and be antinomians. Well, look at Paul's answer. Therefore, my brethren, you also are made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another. Who? To him who was raised from the dead. And this is what's called a henna clause in the Greek. It's the purpose. Why did he do that? Why? What's this marriage for? What should it produce? In order that we might bear fruit for God. There's the whole gospel. There's the whole Bible. It's, it's a marriage that produces fruit. The fruit of our being joined to law only produce sin. Why do you want to keep running back to it? Why do you want to get back to Moses? I meet people weekly that just love Moses and want to stay there. Just Christ. That's your new marriage. That's where you've gone. More law just produces more sin. But this new union joins us to Christ. And it doesn't make you lawless. It doesn't make you just go sin. It says it bears fruit for God, like love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, the fruits of the Spirit. The old husband was impotent to bear righteousness called the law. But through death, it terminated our old relationship to the law <clears throat> into a new one with a fruitful relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. We die to the law that we might be joined to Christ. And God says, be fruitful and multiply through the Holy Spirit indwelling you this union will begin to bear fruit that you could have never produced under law or in your own strength. That's the whole Bible. So this idea of going on sinning because we're free, grace, it misses it so badly. You've been joined to Christ. The dominion of sin is broken. You have a new master and you have a new husband has been our arguments. Your heart is melted by the grace of God and all you want to do is please your new master and your new bridegroom. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? How much time? Okay, I'm going to mess around. Turn to Galatians 5. I got eight things I want to go over, and I'm going to do two. Maybe I'll do this other one while you're turning. John Piper shares an illustration that I've, I've always loved on this. And he says, I want you to picture a house and inside this house is to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. 
That's the fulfillment of the whole law. And, and you come to the front door and there's a padlock and you try to pick it and it says, thou shall not covet, thou shall not steal, click, click, thou shall not commit adultery. And no one has ever been able to pick that lock. No one has ever been able to fulfill it, to get in, to be able to fulfill the law's demands. And so no one can get in that way. And so Jesus Christ comes and he fulfills it. And he breaks the padlock. And he has Christ carrying you in the back door, but I like the front door because he fulfilled the law. And when he, when he takes it, you're, by faith, you're joined to him and you come in the house. You're brought into the kingdom of God and you don't say, thank you, Jesus. Now I'm going to go love and live. And it's like, no, you abide in Christ and you stay with him in this relationship. And as you are abiding in him, what's going to come out is going to be the fruit of love to God and love to others. Galatians 5. I've gone over this a lot, but I want to do it one more time. Verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. He's saying the gospel has set you free. Don't go back under the law. Don't go back under to performance to get your acceptance from God. Fight it. He's writing this to believers. Believers, go back under that. You start thinking it and putting yourself back under it. Do not be subject again to what you have no jurisdiction. You're done with it. Quit going back there. Stop. Behold, I, Paul, say to you, if you receive circumcision, Christ will be no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he's under obligation to keep the whole law. You want to get in through covenant law keeping, then do it. But you've got to keep the whole thing. But you're severed from Christ. The gospel's over. You're, not seeking, you're seeking to be justified by law. You've fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit, we'll look at that next week, by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. I'm going to save just a little bit of time. Uh, go to verse 13. For you were called to freedom, and that's what I've been preaching all morning. This is the freedom, brethren. But don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. So that means, can I go be lawless because I'm out? No. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement. And here's the law of Christ. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and we're going to flesh this out in a few weeks. You will not carry out the desires of the flesh, for the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you might not do the things you please. That's that remaining sin we've talked about, and, and, and it, will, it will stir it up. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Hear that. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under this law. And now here's what happens when you're under law. The deeds of the flesh are evident. And this, this could be your life in a nutshell. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities. You fight with everybody, anyone who gets in your path. You fight with strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you as I forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Get under law, get under there with flesh, and it makes you uh, hurt, angry, frustrated, needing things to comfort you, and you will just live Galatians 5, the deeds of the flesh, the rest of your days. But those led by the Spirit who've come out from under the law, married to Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and this is where we usually stop but against such things, there is no law. You can't get through the Spirit by law. You got you to die to the law. And you come out and you believe this gospel and stand firm in your freedom and live into justification by faith in Christ alone. And it's going to bear fruit that's going to start coming out of you. And all of a sudden, I can love in a way I never could under the law. And I have a joy and I have a peace. And I'm patient to let God work in me. I have self-control. I don't have to have it all now because I have everything in Christ. So this marriage will produce fruit. That will be love and the Holy Spirit. And in the law, I, so many of you still like the law to get your holiness. And all it produces is a frustration and a lack of... You become loveless is what it truly produces. And you judge everyone else. You look down on them. You're self-righteous. That's where that will always lead. But the beauty of this new covenant 
married to Christ, that's what you have. Questions? I could talk, get in your community groups this week and talk about this all week. Dig in and wrestle with it. I got one word for anyone who's coming as an unbeliever. Please see what's being offered to you this morning. Religion and law can't fix your problem. And you can keep trying to be a good person and and do the scale thing. I'm better than the guy down the road. And you can do that forever and that will never get you out from under the law. If you're going to get under the law, you got to keep it perfectly. If you stay under that, you will will abide under the wrath of God forever because the condemnation from the law must be dealt out. But what's being offered to you is a Savior who came and kept the law perfectly and he died on a cross for every sin that you've ever committed. And for the one who will come by faith to him, he will join you to Christ and give you all the benefits of what he has done. And you can be married to Christ. And in that relationship, he'll begin to change everything about you. And so I want you, Jesus says, come not to Moses, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden with law, and I'll give you rest for your souls. That's what's being offered to you this morning. Rest for your soul. And one closing application for my dear brethren. When you're married to the law, I I hear so much talk about self-image today. And so as I was thinking through it is, how how do you get your self-image? How do you get, a self-image is mostly what do people say about you? What did your parents say about you? What did your teachers, your coaches, your friends? And based on what everyone says about you growing up, you begin to get a self-image, but based on what people say to you and what they tell you. And so what did the law tell you when you were married to the law? (laughs) Perfection, condemnation. All all you were told is you're a failure. You're, you're, You're broken. You're sinful. You're condemned. So you're married to the law. It doesn't help your self-image. The law never said, well done, good and faithful servant. This is my beloved son and who I'm well pleased. You never got that from the law. It just showed me who I really am and I'm worse than I ever thought. And then it condemned me. That was my marriage to the law. Living in insecurity, trying to fix myself, trying to be better than other people, trying to to have all my kids dressed and look nice so everyone applauds me. I wanted to know that I'm okay and worthy of someone's love or approval. And I was just strung out. Great marriage, right? (laughs) I'll skip that. It was a ministry of death, the law. What was it like being married to the law? Man, it killed me. You could be married to Christ this morning. And now what he tells me is I'm justified. The God of the universe has told me I'm accepted, I'm beloved, and he really likes me. I'm accepted. I'm loved by God. He's received me. Zephaniah says he delights over me. He says that you measure up. That bears fruit for God. Are you under law or under grace? And the ones under grace, it will change and transform your life. And that's what preaches to you. My prayer is for everyone in this church building this morning and in the live stream is that you would be married to Christ and come under grace and that that relationship would bear true fruit for God and change and transformation. I pray that would flow out of this church and out into this world. And so let's pray and ask God for that. I'm longing for a church that loves and the only way we'll ever get there is to die to the law and be married to Christ. That's how God bears fruit for the kingdom of God in this new covenant. So let's pray and ask him. Father, I love this church. And I pray that there's nothing but good marriages sitting here this morning. I pray that they're all so happy in Jesus. They believe this gospel and they can't get over it. They they live under grace. And the spirit, his role is to show the beauties and glories of Christ. And and they read this word and they see this new covenant and this marriage and, and it's bearing fruit in their lives. God, this world has rejected us, hurt us, <laughs> said so many harmful things, and now we're, we're not under that law, we're under Christ who just says, well done, justified. God, let that seep into every mind and heart. Let this be the best marriage ever, to be naked and unashamed, to open ourselves up to the glorious Christ and let him dissect and destroy sin in all areas of our life. 
God, what a beautiful marriage. Let it bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Let us be believing ones. And so I thank you that we've died to the law and we're out from under that awful jurisdiction. And now my new jurisdiction is the grace of Almighty God in a marriage to Jesus Christ. Lord, would the Hinnah Clause be true of every heart here this morning that we might bear fruit for God, that nothing can explain us but our, our, our marriage to Jesus Christ and all would want to know the Savior, our bridegroom. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. And all God's people said,